Welcome back, everybody, to a very, very special 50th episode of Take a Break with Steven, Steven Seamus. Oh, thank you. Alex. You mean they haven't kicked this off yet, Alex? Not yet. No, no, no. I've gotten a couple letters from YouTube, but uh, I've just ignored them and thrown them in the trash. Now, by the way, I'm no mathematician, mm-hmm. but 50 episodes, and we're doing one a week. In two weeks, we what's will our, have been on the air for a year. It's our year anniversary. What is that? Paper? What's what's the one year anniversary? It's it's like wood or something. Like you like five years is gold, ten years is diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> uh you. Your gift is in the mail, Alex. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I bet. You should get it sometime. Right. I don't want my breath, but uh, it, it's coming. No, I get You'll it. You'll get it sometime whenever. Listen, <laughs> Alex, when we started this, did you think we'd last a year? Yeah, I definitely thought we'd la- last oh, a really? year. It's the year and a half mark that I have on my calendar in the future that I'm like, are you still there? Is, is everything still going okay? You know, future That's Alex. True, I, leave I, myself, know. I leave myself notes. I don't know. We've been a team for a year. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's going to be one of those comic reboots where maybe I. Uh, oh yeah, know. maybe it'll be uh, taking taking breaks with Steven. Maybe we'll re- we'll rebrand and we'll relaunch with a new with a new one. Taking breaks instead of take uh, a break. <laughs> so today we have a, a guest star, which we yes. don't get that often, but it's yes. nice when we have them. A real uh, pro. A real pro, yeah. We have Adam <laughs> Phillips, who's been at DC, I think, since uh, DC started, right? Like back in uh, 1900. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he still has like his that. comp collection of Action Comics <laughs> 1 and Detective 27. He, he has the binder. Yeah. The bindered versions of Action Comics. Ooh. Yeah. So we're going to we're gonna talk about uh, a lot of uh, historical stuff today, right? we got some yeah. cool stuff to talk about. Yeah. We're, we're going to really dive into this thing called Marvel Age, which is a funny opening eye moment for a lot of collectors. I know. And we're seeing it also, uh, Alex, with the uh, previews, some of the yeah, previews, previews that have exactly. like, the, the ultimate Spider-Man on the cover, like thousands yeah. of thousands. Because honestly, everyone threw them out. Even, even oh, 100%. the percent collectors in this that we, we like tossed them. Or, or like these. 50 cent bids are like 20 for a dollar. Like nobody kept these books. Every every dealer you know right now, <laughs> the, the, before they go back to their first show, they yeah. got 500 boxes on a truck. Before they do anything, they go, <laughs> they're right. Like, find the Marvel Ages. Yep. I'm telling you, you know what I even saw? I saw Punisher War Journal 6 and 7, which they must have printed 4 million Gazillions. copies of. Yeah. They're like $150, nine uh, eights now. Mm-mm. Like, that was a great, that's like, to me, that's Jim's best work. Yeah. But they printed so many copies of this book. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, that that number six is Jim's best cover ever, I think. Yeah, that's just the personal <laughs> personal choice. OK, great. So uh, let, let's get to talking to Adam and we'll get we'll dive right in. Yep. Welcome, Adam. It's great to see you today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to be here. So for our audience out there, Adam uh, Phillips has a unique name. He is the Sage of Marvel Age. Yes. Very, very interesting. And he's also formerly of DC Comics. He was there for a very long time. I used to get all my uh, monthly uh, uh, DC previews from him. So uh, so I, I know him from all, uh, all those years. I used to look forward to that in my inbox. <laughs> very cool. So Adam, t- t- today we're going to talk a, a little bit about the Marvel Age stuff. And a lot of these appearances that you're starting to see escalate, first of all, they have very, very low pops because people tended to chuck them. And they have low pops in nine eights because they were sort of treated as sort of catalogs. Um, you've seen them start to escalate and skyrocket in value because a lot of the appearances predate the first appearances that we see in the comic books. So before we get into the nitty gritty of it all, talk a little bit about Marvel Age, what it is, what it was, and, and, and what is the legacy of Marvel Age? Sure. So Marvel Age started um, in 1983 at the beginning of that year. It ran for about 11 years, 140 issues. And it was a monthly magazine that looked like a comic book. You know, it was that shape and size. Um, and every month it was sort of the, the uh, look ahead at what's coming from Marvel. Sometimes it would be big things like Secret Wars. Sometimes it would be weird little side projects that nobody ever heard of. And occasionally um, they talk about projects that never saw the light of day. Uh, I was just reading an issue where there's an interview with uh, a creator talking about a graphic novel. And I, I can't find any evidence that that ever got published, even, <laughs> wow. even though yeah. they showed art and stuff. Um, yeah, it ran a long time. And that's where I started my career, actually. Um, 
like the first stuff I did in comics was writing articles for Marvel Age in like 1985. And then I was an assistant editor there for a year and a half. I kept writing all the way through. And a lot of my friends worked on it too. So I wanted to start this blog where I talked about, you know, really cataloged like everything that was in the issues and had some color commentary about like, well, this thing never got published or this seems like a questionable choice. Like there was a great article in an early issue that put a couple of Marvel um, adaptations of movies side by side, but they were Return of the Jedi and Rock and Rule. Ooh, <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, that's oh, Ralph, you know, Ralph, Ralph Bash, Bashke. Ralph Bashke's yes. Rock and Rule. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah, I, I had no idea how you knew that. By the way. Ah, of course <laughs> I know that. Yeah, There's a Marvel Super Special Rock and Rule, I believe. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, it's two points. Two points, Alex. <laughs> So, so uh, by the way, when you were at Marvel back in the, at, at that time, who, what was the leadership team? Who was the editor-in-chief? Who were you working with at that time? Oh, sure. So editor-in-chief was Jim Shooter. Oh, who, Shooter, of course. Yes. Uh, it was the, the later days of Jim Shooter's reign. And, um, you know, I was semi-friendly with him. But, I mean, I was a, a lowly assistant editor. My boss was Jim Salakrup. Oh, Salakrup, oh, sure. With great guy super nice guy yeah yeah super nice guy and um i still talk to him from time to time um and i mean it, it was funny when i when i was at dc and i was doing all the solicitation stuff which it, di it didn't start immediately at dc but it was a, you know a few years in it was remarkably similar to what i did at marvel on marvel age because it was like going door to door banging on people's doors and saying what do you have for me um and you know people if you look through Marvel Age, I would at least notice that like certain editors' books really got a lot of play because those guys were ready, <laughs> and right, other right, people right. were not. I got you. I got you. So, yeah. so we're we're gonna dive into some specific nitty gritty books here, and then after we talk about those particular books, uh, if there's any other highlights that you want to bring up, we, we'd love to hear it from you. Sure. So, so the, the the first book I want to talk about is from March of 1984. It was Marvel Age number twelve. Uh, first black costume Spider-Man. Uh, for our audience out there, there are 77 blue label 9.8s. There are 21 gold label 9.8s, probably signed by Stan Lee or Mike Zeck or whatever. That book sells for 850 bucks in a nine. That's crazy. Um, it, it, it is noted that it does predate Amazing Spider-Man 252 with a Mike Zeck cover. Um, talk a little bit about that book, the impact. And obviously that 252 book is absolutely on fire, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a bunch of sketches in there. It's um, it's an unusual issue, actually, I found, because I went through them the other, the ones you're going to talk about the other day, and I realized, like, one of the things that's, um, to me, makes Marvel Age interesting is that every single issue has um, a unique cover. Oh, yeah. But this one beautiful. didn't. This one actually had the cover of Marvel Superhero Secret Wars number one on it. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I mean, those sketches make it everything, you know. Um, there's really, um, that is by far the, the biggest important thing in the issue. Like some of the other ones we're going to talk about, you know, you could get, say it might be this, it might be that, but, um, yeah. And, and secret wars, you know, th th that's the big talk with Marvel is, is that going to be the next, you know, of end game infinity war? Is that, is it going to be secret wars? And if mm. it is, you're going to, you're going to see a continued escalation of those books. Those books, the Secret Wars books, have jumped considerably themselves in the last year as well. Adam, what 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 was the timetable? So, like, Marvel Age twelve came out. When would Secret Wars come out? It was it a three month? Oh, sure. Was it no, a three actually, months? It was tight. It was. Um, I actually have the dates here. So, Secret Wars. Um, sorry, Marvel Age twelve came out December sixth, nineteen eighty three. And the first Secret Wars issue was January 24th. It's so all about six weeks later. Oh, wow. So they were not really using this to drive ordering so much as just drive fans to pick up the comics themselves. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Which is different than it is today. Which right. is, it really is. It's all driving about ordering. It's all driving yeah. the ordering. Yeah, Great. absolutely. So, so the next one we want to talk about, which is a very, very popular one for signature series uh, over the years, Marvel Age number 41, August of 86. Uh, it's got the Stan Lee photo cover, one of the very few Stan Lee photo covers, uh, 128 blue label 9.8s, 45 gold label 9.8s, all Stan Lee, of course. <laughs> uh, that book sells for about $175.98. Sadly, Stan can't sign them anymore. Otherwise, I think 
as these Marvel agents became more, more popular, I think more people would have gone to get Stan to sign these. So talk, talk a little bit about the decision to put Stan's photo on the cover, because that was very unusual at the time to have photo covers. We see it now regularly with mm -hmm. Marvel films, but you very rarely saw it back then. Yeah, it is unusual. And like, I literally just finished reading a Stanley biography, you know, these days, a Stanley, there's a Stanley biography coming out every two right, weeks. Every two weeks, just, just like. like a new, uh, new number one. Yeah, always, exactly. There's always a new one. <laughs> there's so many of them, but back then it was very unusual. There was no such thing as a book about Stan Lee. And this is probably one of the first places anyone could read up and find out a sort of cohesive story about who he was and what he did for Marvel. And uh, interestingly, by the way, this is one of the other things I like about the series overall, that story about Stan Lee written by Kurt Busiek. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. They, that same issue has an article by uh, Fabian Nicieza and uh, an article by Shelley Fish, who writes kids comics these yeah. days for DC. So, you know, there's a lot of familiar names in there and it um, definitely makes it more fun. Yes, and for those uh, out there, Fabian is the co-creator of Cable, of course. Uh, Deadpool. Mm -hmm. Deadpool. And Deadpool. 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 Yes, I was going to Louise's Cable. Louise, Louise's Louise's cable. cable. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sorry. And by the way, I'm going to mention since we're talking about Fabian, he has a highly anticipated oh, where is new novel? crime novel coming out in a couple of months. I can't wait to read it. Cool. Called yeah, uh, Suburban yeah. Dicks. Yep. Yeah, we've known Fabian for forever because we used to work <laughs> with him back on Wizard Magazine all the time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the next book uh, to to really uh, dig into is Marvel Age number 97, February of 1991, first Dark Hawk. There's only 33 blue label 9.8s. There's only two gold label 9.8s. That's about a $650 book. It's got a Mike Manley cover. What's interesting about Dark Hawk, and Alex and I have discussed this on the show many, many times, for even though there's never been a TV, even though there's never been a film, never nothing, there's been so much speculation with this Dark Hawk character over the years that the price continues to escalate on the Dark Hawk one. We can't figure it out. I'm not sure what the attraction or the appeal is with Dark Hawk and the anticipation of it. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that particular issue preceding Dark Hawk and what people love so much about this Dark Hawk character. I got to say, um, I am, I mean, I know the stuff you're talking about in terms of um, the speculation and things. Um, I'm not the biggest Dark Hawk expert you'll ever right. find, you know. <laughs> So it's, yeah, it's a bunch of pages from the first issue. It came out before the first issue and it drove a lot of anticipation, but yeah, it's all speculation and who knows where it's going to go. I mean, right now, Marvel has to be building their next wave of uh, movies. Dark Hawk could be in it. I, you know, your guess is about as good Why as Why not? Right? And, that, and I think Dark Hawk is like the speculator's love child. Like everybody's like, Oh, yeah. nine point eights are only forty dollars. I'm buying four of them. Like they, they've been buying and buying and buying them, and they're just like hoping and praying that 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 it, it takes off more. But you know, again, it's all what you like. Like I like Muppet Babies, so I buy all the Marvel Muppet Babies books. You know, mm -hmm. like you know, it's all whatever you like. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what you're also starting to see, uh, which which we touched on a little bit earlier, is the earlier issues tend to have higher pops. I don't know if people kept them more or whatever. I remember when we used to get the Marvel Ages at the, sh at the shop, we used to just throw them out at the end of the month. We, there was really no point in keeping them. It was nothing that we ever kept or, or held on to. I'm actually surprised so many of these even survived at all. But when you start to look at the pop reports later on, they get to be really, really low. And, and if, they're, if these actually do start to get more collector interest, you're going to see prices skyrocket because... These are, I don't even know if these are in dollar boxes, Alex. I think these were just thrown in the garbage. I, I mean, can you speak to that, Adam, a little bit about, about did they get thrown out? Did they get held on to or were they you know, returnable? Um, <laughs> I don't think they were returnable, but you know, um, that's a really good point. Like I assembled, I had a few issues from the old days and I put together a set of Marvel ages last year. It's 140 issues, four annuals and two specials. And I basically did it between about three stores that had them. I just contacted people and said, hey, do you have them? And one of the guys I talked to was really frank and said, yeah, I didn't know what to do with them. I, they could have ended up in a dollar bin because there's just not that much demand for them unless you're the right kind of you know, speculator buyer. 
Um, but he he was happy to just give me big stacks of them for not much money. Funny, it's funny. Did did you find any particular issues were really really hard to find? Like as you get later in the run, they just yeah, yeah. The the ones later in the run, a couple of issues with Jim Lee covers and uh, things like that got more difficult to find. And also the uh, the preview specials were a little more difficult. And I think that's just because nobody knows they exist pretty much. All right, so let's talk about those for a second. Do you, do you happen to know which ones are the Jim Lee covers or, or do you have that information? Uh, I've got it. <laughs> I would have to dig. Let me put it this way. Okay. I do have That's okay. there. They're around That's issue okay. 80 or 90, something like that. All right, Alex and I will tackle that at, at another time. And then you said the other yes. one that was hard to find were the, uh, the which, which covers were they? So Did there are two Marvel Age preview specials, preview specials that were done late um, toward the end of the run of the whole project. Um, right. and yeah, they were a little hard to find. So I Alex think, and I will have to dig into that. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think yeah. most stores and, you know, not to put Midtown on blast, but when I was the, the back issue guy for Midtown, we would never, they were just automatically dollar bin. We, we didn't even look at them, just put them yeah. in the dollar, dollar bin, dollar bin, dollar bin. Because like I'm saying, it's like the average fan for a buck, you'll buy it. Cause you're like, Oh, what a great Spider-Man cover who I don't care. It's a buck, but like mm -hmm. a collector of Marvel age was few and far between that. It, it didn't, it wasn't worth our time to worry about putting them in the system and grading them and doing all the stuff, but like, just put them in the dollar bin. If someone wants them, they'll buy them there. So a lot of these are going to be like, beat up or gone or, you know, people threw them away. Cause they're cattle. They think they're catalogs. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they, 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 they look like it too. But, you yeah. know, I think the ones with like McFarlane cover, which we'll talk about in a minute, were, were a little bit heavier uh, held on to. Then the next one is Marvel Age number 98. Right. March of 91. Uh, the first Toxic Avenger, okay? Yes. There's only three nine eights uh, blue labels. There's zero gold labels. That book sells for, the last nine eight sold for $1,300 with a Rod Ramos cover. Talk a little bit about that book and why is the Toxic Avenger one? Is it because it was late in the run? It's hard to find. What is it about that? There's book so much expensive? in that book. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff and it's it's kind of crazy. Toxic Avenger, you know, you guys know, it's sort of an evergreen character. Mm -hmm. They've done movies, TV series, animated stuff. Uh, I'm kind of a fan. Um, I actually spent a day once with um, the head of Trauma Films when we were doing a project that never He's came crazy. to light. Lloyd Kaufman, crazy and, that guy. And no, Lloyd Kaufman, what a great yeah, guy! Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's just it's a lot of it is just that fondness for the character, you know, that um, it's a nostalgia thing because uh, kids grew up with it. Uh, in my mind, anyway. The interesting thing I was finding, I was telling Alex this the other day. The interesting thing I was finding in that issue, there's an article on a character called Nightcat. Yeah, and Nightcat was. Uh, like a rock singer who had sort of a superhero stage persona for real. I mean, she was a real person, not a, just a cartoon. And um, somehow they entered into some kind of agreement with Marvel where they would do a Marvel Nightcat comic book. And they did one issue and then she kind of disappeared. They did an album too, which I sent uh, Alex the link to the other yes. day. It's on YouTube. It's wonderful. Um, it's it's fabulous. wonderful. <laughs> I need to find I need to find it on, on an LP. I gotta complete yeah, that, my Marvel LP collection. That would be great. <laughs> and then um she starred in Tromeo and Juliet after that. So she must have had a trauma connection. Uh Tromeo and Juliet, James Gunn. I believe he wrote that movie. Yeah, that's right. He wrote it. Wow. He, I don't think he directed it, but he did write it. Uh, yeah. Fun this fun is, fact. I, it's fun like fact full that. circle, right? Toxie, trauma, <laughs> James Gunn. Guardians of the Galaxy back back around again. Yes. Got it. Got it. Um, the okay. other thing that was interesting in the issue is there's an interview with Brian Hitch, and he's like a 20 year old who's just been discovered in the U.S. <laughs> and he's funny. talking about how great it is to come, but no, he's not planning on moving to the U.S. He's going to stay in England for now. Right. So he's a kid. Which he, wow. Which, which, he, <laughs> which, he, which he held to, by the way. I actually own yes. a few Brian Hitch pieces. We used to bring him to the U.S. He used to come to the U.S. maybe once a year for a mm -hmm. show. Um, just to meet his fans. He, he, he understood that the fans wanted to meet him. He was always gracious. Um, so he would, once a year, he'd come to one of our wizard shows and he'd make the trek and usually Chicago or Philly, one of the bigger shows where he would meet the most amount of fans. So 
He was it's always awesome. gracious. He was always gracious meeting the fans. So that was, <laughs> it was, it was a good little story. So cool. then there's some other, then there's some other random issues I want to just talk about a little bit. Maybe you can a- add some commentary to it. So Marvel age number 29 with the first long shot, long shot is a character uh, that again, there's a lot of speculation there. Uh, that book in a nine, eight can sell up to $500 number 29. It's got Easy. that very cool Scarlet Witch and vision cover. Um, you, can you talk a little bit about Longshot and Marvel that that Marvel Age twenty nine? Longshot Longshot was a sensation from day yeah. one. People were nuts about it, but nuts about Arthur Adams. Um, and I mean, it would be fantastic to see him show up as a character in some of these movies. I think it would be absolutely amazing. He has to have the mullet. If there's no yeah, mullet, that's sure. not Longshot. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Alex, talk a little bit about the character Longshot. I mean, what is it about the appeal of, of Longshot? I, 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 I'm I a Longshot fan. I love the, the, the when he's on the X-Men team, it's great. I don't know. It, it's like Darkhawk. It's like people love Longshot. He's lucky. He, you know, that's his power. He's lucky and things go his way and fights and everything. But I, I think, I think it's like the perfect mix of like the leather jacket, the design, yeah. you know, just, just, you know, everything about him is just like, Oh, that's cool. That's a cool character. And people just love him. I don't know. Marvel's usually on top of things. I'm surprised with Dark Hawk and Longshot. Like, again, you're talking about characters that keep coming up over and over again, but yet they haven't necessarily done. I mean, look, we're seeing we're seeing Jubilee and Bishop and all these first appearances. Gambit, these these appearances are going crazy, but yet they, they're supposed to be in the films, but they haven't actually made it in there yet. So. Uh, then the next one, obviously, we've already seen Marvel Age number number 82. I'm surprised this one's not more uh, from December of 89. It's the first cable. Mm. Um, you know, it's interesting. The 97 New Mutants cable book sells for, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred dollars in a nine eight. The Deadpool number 98 book sells for six times that. There's a huge disparity in price in the two issues, even though they basically have the same print runs. Um, so, so talk a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, Adam, maybe you could talk a little bit about Cable and then Alex, maybe talk about Cable and Deadpool. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, obviously Cable is a, a big, big, big deal in the comics, in the uh, the movies and things. And I mean, there's only there's only room to grow for a character like that in those places. So, yeah, he was um, Josh Brolin and- was great in the Deadpool movie, like. I, I I think if they want to do another spinoff and do a cable movie, I think they, they, they've got it right there on lock. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't already like announce something. But Alex, why do you think the disparity is so much between the New Mutants 87 and the New Mutants 98? Uh, I think the cable fans. How do I how do I how do I quote this without being the, the, the Deadpool fans is global, right? Everybody knows what Deadpool is. Everybody knows what Spider-Man, everybody knows what Batman is, everybody knows what Superman is. So I think with Deadpool, you actually have that as well, because it's it's just a character that there's so much merchandise. There's the movies, Ryan Reynolds, like everything. Everybody loves Deadpool. Cable is still kind of like, oh, if you read X-Men comics, you know who Cable is. If you don't read comics, you might not know who Cable is other than being in the Deadpool movie. Got it. Got it. Okay. The next one I want to talk about, Adam, is Marvel Age number 90 with McFarlane. Uh, there's 42 blue label 9.8s. There's 16 gold labels, obviously, signed by Todd. It's got a Spider-Man number one preview in there, and it's got a Todd cover. Now, one thing that I remembered working in the store at the time is anything with Todd McFarlane on the cover sold. Anything. And what you're starting to see today's market is even those uh, amazing Spider-Man issues where they were printing millions of copies a month and the Spider-Man Todd McFarlane series where they printed millions of copies a month. Uh-huh. Those books are selling in nine eights for real money, like even regular run of the mill McFarlane, whatever. So there is definitely a return to that. Talk a little bit about that Marvel preview, uh, that Marvel age issue with the McFarlane cover um, and the Spider-Man one preview. Yeah. Well, God, it can't be much bigger than that. Right. I mean, that's a, a fantastic cover. McFarlane, always hot. And actually, I'm looking at the cover right now on uh, Mike's Amazing World of Comics. Um, that there's a Jim Lee interview in there as well. So that's got to be yeah, pushing it double. too, you know. Yeah, yeah and it and it and it uh, it predated Spider-Man number one because it's listed as July of 1990. I'm not sure the exact date of Spider-Man number one, but you're right. It's probably about a six-week window after that where Spider-Man yeah. one came out. 
where that book in terms of the print run is probably top three or four of all time. I think X-Men is number one. Um, and it's interesting, even with Spider-Man number ones, with all the versions and all the variants and all the everything, even those books today, people love getting those signed by Todd whenever he does the signature series, whenever he does the mail-in. That's a book that everybody is sending in. It's just, it's one of those like iconic classic covers that just never seems to, to grow old for people. Um, and then the last book that I want to talk about is Marvel Age number 118. It's the first Hulk Maestro, 1992, November. Uh, it's about a $10 raw book. It's got a very awesome George Perez cover on there. What's interesting about the book is that it's got the trading card in it. And what Alex and I have noted over the past few episodes is that anything with the trading card in it, uh, including X-Force number one, where they printed like four or five million copies of this book, are now $30, $40, right? Because it's got the trading card and everybody needs a trading card. And if you get a PSA 10, forget it. It's worth five, $600. So that what, what people don't remember is at that time, Wizard Magazine had started in 1991. So this was 91, 92. Companies had just started putting trading cards in these poly bags. That it was not a thing back in the late 80s. That was a thing in the early 90s. Um, that was something that we kind of started the trend, but I didn't even know about this Marvel Age card. So talk a little bit about that issue, uh, Hulk Maestro, which is now a character that people care about. It's very, very early George Perez as well. Sure. Well, um, there's a point in Marvel Age, I want to say around an issue 110 or so, where they did double covers. And so this is, uh, I believe, one of those issues. Um, you know, Perez, again, another artist who is always going to be beloved, but having that trading card element is, is a big deal. And, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day, actually, that like Marvel has tried, what, two, three times to have a Hulk solo movie. And I wonder if they'd ever consider doing like this version of the Hulk to try to oh, um, give it a sort of a leg up and make it different. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they did the World War uh, a Hulk sort right, of, right? Yeah in the in the film um alex what do you think about that uh i mean i talk about coming out of nowhere. okay right now marvels we see with the tv shows especially with wandavision that they're they're doing they're going outside of the box they're they're, for, they're breaking the formula you know it's not just this is marvel universe is marvel universe. they're doing different things i think it a future maestro type story would be gangbusters i just i, I don't i don't know if the world would be ready for it <laughs> but I, I think if they made it, I think it'd be it'd be it'd be crazy. Look, maybe bring Ed Norton back. Maybe oh my! You, God. You, maybe yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right, you can bring Ed Norton back. Um, Al, yes. Adam, do you feel like we missed any of the other Marvel Age uh, significant issues, or you feel like we we nailed them all today? I think you've really covered all the uh, the big highlights. Um, you know, there are a few more here and there. It's a little more Vision and Scarlet Witch stuff once in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, these are definitely some of the biggest issues for sure. I have a right. big question. Okay, sure. I need, I need a I need a percentage for you. <laughs> uh, Marvel on the bus, Marvel Ages. Oh my God, that would be <laughs> that would be something else. I DC just did that. Who's Who, and those are yeah. amazing. But all that information's completely wrong. Uh, every single bit of it. No, it's not right. But, <laughs> but, I was uh, really surprised. That's great. I was really surprised. About five years ago, Marvel did a series of uh, Howard the Duck trades and i'm mm -hmm. a huge howard the duck fan yeah steve gerber and phenomenal. in volume four they reprinted an article i wrote about howard the duck from marvel age what? 43 <laughs> and the cover to that issue i guess they were trying to fill some space but uh <laughs> i was like amazed i i i miss me even if they did well i wouldn't do an essentials i i would definitely want a color version but give me the epic collections i'll i'll, I'll sign up for what is it, 100 and some issues what is it probably like 140 30 epic collections i'll take it <laughs> i'll take it give, give them i to like me. it yeah. so adam before we log off today is there anything else that you that you're plugging well yeah for sure so i want to mention of course the blog itself which is make mine marvel age dot blog blogspot dot com and i'm Amazing. doing about three issues a week of coverage um, and color commentary and things. And the other thing, the big news that I, you know, is an actual money-making venture is I'm launching a uh, marketing agency, untoldstoriesmarketing.com. Awesome. The, uh, the goal of it is to help publishers connect better with retailers. And uh, you can learn more at untoldstoriesmarketing.com website right now. 
Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Mazel, by the way, Mazel Tov, we always love entrepreneurial stuff. I mean, I'm somebody who started a bunch of companies. We started Wizard back in the day. We started Ace. We started the card store with my mom. So <laughs> I get it. It's it's congratulations. That's that's always uh, that's always wonderful to hear. Uh, and a needed and a needed story. thing in this industry for sure. Thanks. And I'm really thrilled to do it. You know, I um, I think I'm like the only person who left DC in the last six months who was like going, yeah, I'm gonna do something cool. Uh, <laughs> it opens up. I have so much room for possibilities now. Yeah, a lot, yeah. Of, a, lot of, a lot of room for growth. Okay, yeah. uh, so so thank you, everybody. If, if uh, Thank you, Adam, for joining us today. If you feel like we missed anything, any of the Marvel agents, just please post it in the comments. And, uh, and we hope to see everybody next week. We will see you next week. Same bat time. Same bat channel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Adam. All right, thanks so much.